Hello everyone, this is Gene from NYC, and the special item for today is the Street Fighter 2 animated movie from way back in 1992. And it's the unrated for mature audiences only version. AKA, it has the infamous Chun-Li sa- uh, shower scene, <laughs> uh, unedited and uncut. I remember watching this movie way, way, way back in the day, several times. I had like the original v- VHS version, which was also unedited and uh, un- unrated, though I wouldn't call a 10-year-old <laughs> a mature audience to be seeing that that type of thing, but it made an impression on me. I still consider to this day the uh, Chun-Li Vega fight scene to be one of the best animated fight scenes I have ever seen in life. Now, believe it or not, this is not about a review of this movie, though I probably will do a review of this film down the line. This is what I'm going to call the Happy Comic Review. I'm finally going to discuss a comic that uh, is one of my favorites. Given that X-Men has always been one of my favorite books, I'm a big fan of the classic X-Men. Got into X-Men because of the cartoon way, 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 way back in the day in the early 90s. I, I I read twice, actually three times. One of my favorite issues, issues 170, X, uh, Uncanny X-Men issue 170, or that one time that Callisto and Storm got into a knife fight for control of the Morlocks. So let me just start at the top, go through the story, I'll make comments and ramble and rant as I go through it, as I always do with these reviews. So I want to start with the cover. The cover itself is not that impressive. I don't mind simple. Simple is fine. The problem is that there's it's just a boring cover. It's Callisto and Storm with the knives in their hand, close up of their face, and the and the uh, background is uh, red. That's not simple. That's just kind of uninspired, and that's what kind of frustrates me. If there's two things that really hurt this uh, book uh, artistically, it's the fact that uh, the penciler. I believe it's Smith. I believe it's Paul Smith. I think it's definitely a Smith. The last name is Smith. Is that the art? The art has issues. I don't like to to pick on or criticize art from decades past because you know art styles are different. What's considered you know good art changes over the years, and generally speaking, artistic techniques are meant to improve over time. It's kind of like to me, it's kind of like, you know, picking on the graphics of the original uh, Super Mario Brothers game because it was released in 1984, and the best you could do at that time was, you know, 8-bit graphics. And, you know, the the few colors that a Nintendo Entertainment System could achieve. Right? It's not fair to compare the graphics of a video game from 1984 to the graphics that are applicable today and impossible today. At the same time, I have to admit that for this book, the art could have been better. My my biggest issue with the with the art is that the backgrounds tend to be uninspired. The the story starts off with this uh, side story or mini story involving Scott, Scott Summer Cyclops, and Madeline Pryor. And there's this one, there's actually a few panels where it's supposed to be like mountains. They're in like a little hotel like like place, a chalet in, in Alaska. And there are several scenes where, where we're supposed to see mountains in the background because they're in this mountainous area and, and, and the windows are supposed to, there's supposed to be mountains, you know, in the, in, in, in the uh, windows, right? And... The mountains just look like just, just just like white blobs. They could be huge mounds of snow, if you didn't realize that that there were supposed to be mountains. At least I hope there's supposed to be mountains. I don't, honestly don't know. Now there are positive parts to, to the art. The uh, penciler, the artist Smith, he's he's good at um, at hero poses. There is one page where Colossus uh, breaks the ropes that are restraining him, and he's he's in a very dramatic hero pose. You know, the arms are pulled back, the chest is forward, he's uh, leaning forward. It's a very dynamic pose. There's another one where Nightcrawler has, in a sense, taken uh, Callisto hostage, and 
he's standing very heroically. You know, he's got he's he's holding her up with like one arm in the air, and she's kind of laid out in in sort of like a La Pieta type of type of thing, the whole crucified hero pose. So there are bright spots in the art, but if it's not a headshot or a hero pose, the art, at least to me, is really... Jesus Christ, why does it get so dark? <laughs> the art to me is uh, really lacking. On top of that, what happens with, with the panels here is that there are so many panels where it's just a headshot and a pale color in the background. I that frustrates me so much as a reader. I really don't like it from an artistic point of view when the artist doesn't try to put the background in. At times I can accept it, at times it makes sense. But this is done multiple times throughout this issue. And the thing is that there'll be backgrounds in, in other scenes. There'll be backgrounds in, in group fight scenes and, and whatnot. And there'll be backgrounds on, on like, you know, pages that are, that are supposed to set the scene, for example. Like, the opening page, it it's, has this little, you know, uh, cottage type of place, and you see snow and whatnot. It's a background. It's a scene. It's not a great, but it's there. But whenever someone's head is, is, is focused on just no background, no background scenery, just that person's head, their, their thoughts in some pale color... It just seems honestly lazy in my opinion. And I hate to say that because I can only imagine how much work it took to get this issue out back in the day in, what, June 1983. But, again, that that's just a personal quirk of mine. I, I, I really don't like it when when artists abuse the... Uh, abuse leaving the, the focus box, I guess you could say, or, or the headshot box. With, without a background. Once, twice, fine, I can live with it. But constantly? Especially when you've gone through the trouble of, of drawing backgrounds in, in other scenes? I find it frustrating. Another issue with this story is that it's honestly very choppy. And if you're trying to get into X-Men for the first time, and this is one of my favorite issues, but I have to be honest about its issues. If you're trying to get into X-Men for the very first time, you, 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 you don't want your first issue to be issue one, one, ugh, I can't get the word out, 170, 170. And the reason why is because there's so many storylines going on in this story. To break it down, it, bas it basically starts out with Scott and Madeline, and, and their thing is a very, it's a romantic conflict. Then it goes to the fight B between the X-Men and the Morlocks. Then it briefly goes to Kitty and Caliban, right? Which is fine because that's a subplot to the main plot, which is the fight fight between the X-Men and the Morlocks. Then it goes to a it goes to Mystique and Destiny and them and them real realizing that a uh, rogue has a Hi, RJ. <laughs> that the rogue has uh, run away. Then it goes back to the fight. <laughs> and then it finally goes back to the fight between the Morlocks and the X-Men. Then it ends, actually, with, with the return to the story between uh, Scott and Madeline Pryor. So there's a lot of plot threads being explored in this. And if you're not familiar with what's going on, it can be very uh, disorienting. And even if you are familiar with, with what's going on, I have to admit, it makes for a very choppy read. There is no sense of, of, of smoothness. It's not the best word to use, but it's the only thing I can think of. Smoothness or flow when it, when it comes to this story. And then even in the main story, there is... Uh, it's very choppy be because there are uh, false starts. The X-Men uh, attack and then they're restrained. They uh, they they break out of their their restraints and then they're 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 stopped again. It's like when you see a tag team match in in a pro wrestling or any match in in pro wrestling, and they use the hope spot one one too many times. For those who don't know, a hope spot is 
basically when the uh, good guy starts to not to come back and it looks like he might win but then the bad guy you know cheats and finds some way to knock him back on his back that's basically what happens for a good chunk of the main storyline the the fight between the x-men and the morlocks up until the fight finally gets to the the uh knife the uh trial by mortal combat it's basically it the uh, knife fight to the uh, death between Callisto and Storm, which is what was advertised in, in the cover, but it, t- it does take a while to get there. The reason why this is one of my favorite issues of the X-Men, despite the flaws with the, with the uh, flow and with the art, is, be- is, is because of one man, Chris Claremont. Chris Claremont's writing is so good that I'm still willing to invest myself in this story. I think what people like Bendis need to realize, because here's the thing, Chris Claremont is criticized, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, for being a very wordy writer for the comics industry. Comics usually, when it, when it comes to words, less is more, because it's a visual medium. You know, it's usually visuals first, the script is sort of second. I don't take that approach. I think that Ideally, a script and the art should both be great on their own and then best together. But I do understand why a lot of people say, you know, brevity uh, is the better choice in comics because you have visuals. But you, for example, you don't have to use words to describe how someone looks because you can actually depict that in the art. (coughs) However... What I've always liked about Claremont's writing is that, first of all, he doesn't waste words. Yes, he is wordy. Yes, he is flowery. Yes, he does have a certain dramatic flair to his writing. But very rarely does Chris Claremont waste words. Writers like Bendis will just literally word vomit. And you don't know what it's supposed to mean. Claremont is a master at using his words correctly. Not a word is wasted. And he's great at setting up, uh, he's, he's great at using the text boxes and the narrations to basically set up a scene, right, to, 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 to describe the points that you can't see. For example, when the story opens, it talks about his, the na- narration talks about how there's a faint echo of uh, music, and, and it, it paints this, just this very serene, romantic moment that the art really can't capture right so that's one of the things that I really like about his uh, writing he sets up a scene very well even with the art and believe me it's a very good thing that his writing sets up the scene well because the art doesn't do it here I'm sorry I'm sorry it doesn't I don't want to be mean but the art really in this issue is just not all that great at least to my perspective but Claremont's writing is what saves this issue. That and he has such a good command and understanding of the characters that the words they they speak and the way that they speak them seem natural. Kurt's very, you know, dramatic, heroic way of speaking makes sense for him. Um, Storm's very elegant way of speaking makes sense for her. Nobody sounds out of character. Everyone sounds... In character, though I do have to admit, there is something Kurt does in, in this issue that really ticks me off, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna address that. So, I just wanted to to get my issues with the, with the art, the basically my issues with with this issue in general, out the way early, because this really is a good issue. I just wanted to just cover all the bad stuff early, and just get it out. So, what happens is. The book starts out with uh, Madeline and Scott. They're having this their their first date, and this really is all about Scott's internal turmoil. He realizes that he's falling in love with Madeline very fast, much faster than he anticipated, and he's conflicted because Madeline Pryor looks so much like Jean Grey. And he eventually brings that up because they're dancing and then he gets very quiet. Madeline gets very concerned. And then he eventually tells her, you know, that that there was this woman he was once in love with 
Jean Grey. They were going to get married. She died. He's he and he's trying to move on, and he shows Madeline a picture of Jean, and Madeline's like, "It, it, it's me." She has no idea how right she is, but you know, take putting aside, you know, sort of how we know this is all going to end, and just taking the story as it is, you know, I feel for Scott as much as I am not a Scott Summers fan. Scott has always annoyed me as a character because he's such a tightwad, not without reason, but he's a tightwad. But so long as I'm reading this, these, this scene, and, and, and this uh, scene between him and, and Madeline goes on for about three and a half pages. So long as I'm reading this, this his internal thoughts and his, and his words and his interaction with uh, Madeline, I can't dislike the guy. It isn't about whether or not I like him. It's about that I feel for him. My, my heart, like, bleeds for him. This is the power of good writing. I totally put aside the fact that I don't like him. Because at the moment, I am feeling for him. He's a man who is conflicted, who's trying to move on. And he's falling in love again with a woman who looks just like the woman he loved. I can't even imagine what that would feel like for anybody to, to go through that conflict. Uh, there's, a, there's a point where, where um, Madeline even asks, you know, are you interested in me or... Or is it because I remind you of this woman? And Scott admits, I don't know. He's like, I, I want to try, but I honestly don't know. So that's the beginning of the story. Then it goes to the, to the Morlocks, the fight between the X-Men and the Morlocks. Callisto had, had in a previous issue, kidnapped... Call, Callisto kidnapped uh, Angel, uh, Arch, Archangel Warren, Warren Worthington. Caliban had kidnapped Kitty. So the X-Men came in, the X-Men in this case being Storm, uh, Colossus, and Nightcrawler. And they came in to rescue them, and now they've been captured. So the scene starts with, with the wedding, if you want to call it, of Callisto and uh, Angel. And Callisto is in a, only, only thing I can call it is a punk, punk rock wedding dress. I think Callisto's design, from what I can tell, was based off of uh, Joan Jett. I think it's supposed to be Joan Jett if, if Joan was, was strung out on drugs. That's just the vibe that I get. The hair, the face, I definitely think it was meant to be Joan Jett. There, there's even a point where she says that, that, that she took in runaways. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. <laughs> For those, for those who don't know, I think if you're listening to me, for those who uh, don't know, Joan, Joan Jett was part of an all-girl rock group, punk rock type thing, called The Runaways before she went solo. And, and uh, well, she became a solo act, but she also had a, had a backing band called The Blackhearts. So during her, her, the highest moments of her fame in the 1980s, you know, it was basically, the group was known as Joan Jett and The Blackhearts. Though Joan was the main attraction, not the Blackhearts. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you were just the, the uh, backing band. So anyway, so uh, Callisto's in this uh, torn punk rock wedding dress. Uh, Angel is uh, drugged. He was kidnapped. He's been drugged. That or touched by a plague. It might be that that plague touched him. And the poor guy, no joke has been stripped down to his underwear, to his tidy whities and is, is in bondage gear. I am not joking. <laughs> you have to see the image for yourself. He's, he, you have these big, white, fluffy wings. He's in white underwear that somewhat resembles a diaper and bluish-black bondage gear. Dear God, Claremont, <laughs> what are you into? But anyway... Um, so, Jesus, now, uh, now I lost my place. Okay, so this wedding is supposed to happen. The X-Men uh, break free of their bonds. They fight some of the Morlocks. Uh, Colossus fights this big dude named uh, Sunder. Storm uh, gets loose. She summons a little bit of lightning to keep the Morlocks away from her. Uh, Crawler, who actually does have a few cool, cool moments in this, he gets to Callisto. He starts teleporting, 
teleporting throughout the uh, through throughout the labyrinth that that is the Morlock's lair to disorient her. So then, once she's properly properly disoriented, Crawler proclaims that he he has Callisto, and that if the Morlocks don't want to see her harm, they'll stand down. They start to stand down, but then. This little old lady named uh, Plague gets behind Storm, touches her, Storm passes out. Plague explains that she's just given Storm a fever and she's made her terribly ill and that if she touches her one more time, it'll kill Storm. So uh, she basically says, you know, stand down. She she tells Night Nightcrawler to uh, stand down. The X-Men stand down. Then they're um, tied up on these stakes and they're restrained. Uh, the in, the uh, what's used to restrain them is interesting, is because Storm and Storm and Nightcrawler are tied down with um, polymer rope. It basically looks like like garden hose. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me. But uh, what's his face? Uh, Colossus is actually tied down with these heavy uh, metal chains. It looks like 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 you know giant uh, uh, metal chain links. So they use that to uh, tie him down. And then the story briefly goes to um, Caliban and Kitty. Kitty's very ill because Plague had, had touched her. Uh, she begs Caliban to uh, help her, to help the X-Men. Caliban says he can't because Kitty will leave him if he does. Kitty responds that uh, you know she will never for- forgive him if he doesn't. Caliban says that, he's, that he doesn't know what to do. Because he wants Kitty as as a companion and as a friend, he he wants to share his life and his heart with her. My man, you're looking for a wife. Kitty's a teenager. You're too young, too young. That's all I gotta say. Caliban Caliban always touched me because he he, he has such an innocent heart, right? He doesn't realize as he's talking about this that he's describing what he wants as a wife. He, he is so innocent and and sincere in his words and you know that the love that he feels for kitty if misguided is sincere but he says that he isn't a fighter and that if nobody opposes callisto the x-men are doomed and then he says that he he gets a little shakespearean here and he's and he and and he said that no no matter what he does you know he's he's uh caught between a rock and a hard place and Caliban is doomed. So then the story then, then this is what I mean by it's choppy. Then it goes to this nightmare that Mystique is having. She's having this weird dream where she's being chased by some royal hunters. She trips, breaks her ankle, she can't move. One of the hunters is actually Jean Grey and the last thing Mystique sees in the dream is Jean Grey slashing at her throat with a knife. She wakes up in terror. She says that that someone else, is, someone is messing with her mind because that that dream felt way too real. She goes downstairs. Uh, she speaks to uh, Destiny. They talk for for a little bit. Destiny then suddenly gets a vision or something. She says that the timeline has been made clear and that a rogue has has disappeared. Mystique in a panic runs runs up the stairs, notices that that rogue is left. She freaks out. Then then it, then the panel switches to showing rogue looking despondent on a bus, and it, and it mentions how she's just run away from everything that she knows, and she isn't quite quite sure why. And then it goes back to the main fight, which is finally it gets to to the well doesn't quite get to it. Let me back up a little bit. So what happens is that he gets back to the main scene. Caliban finally summons his his courage. He he carries Kitty out to to Callisto and the Morlocks. She's she's uh, passed out because she's so ill. Nightcrawler and uh, uh, Colossus break out of their chains immediately. Colossus promises that if anything happens to Kitty, if she dies, he will he will bring the uh, Morlock layer down on all of their heads. Uh, Nightcrawler asks to see Kitty. He, he says that uh, he 
he has has medical training. He I guess examines her at some point. Doesn't really uh, depict it. And he notes that uh, she's seriously ill. They have to get her back to the mansion uh, as soon as possible. And uh, that's when Caliban, you know, begs begs Callisto to to help Kitty. Callisto pretty much pulls a if she dies, she dies. She 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 pulls a Drago before Ivan Drago exists. That's when Caliban says that the only way to uh, break Callisto's rules is to is to uh, depose her from power, and the only way to do that is to de defeat her in a trial by combat. So then Nightcrawler uh, says that if that's what it takes to, to, to save Kitty, he'll do it. And he formally challenges Callisto to a fight for the leadership of the Morlocks. Callisto uh, adds on to Caliban's statement, stating that uh, this this fight is a fight to the death. And if you know the uh, Blue Boy Scout that um, Nightcrawler is, actually wants to fight to the death. That's when. Uh, Storm speaks up and says that she leads the X-Men and that the duel and the, and the challenge are, are Callisto's life and Callisto's life are hers. Now here's where Crawler, for all of the good deeds he does in this issue, really gets on my nerves. He, in the middle of a fight, right, openly questions the sanity of his field commander. I am not joking. When Storm states that she's the leader, she wants to fight Callisto. Nightcrawler states that she's... First he states that, you know, she's uh, too ill. You know, how is she going? She, she can hardly stand, right? Did she, he, he, he basically ap appeals to her health at first. Like, you know, you've been touched by a plague. You're too ill. Then he says, no joke, we don't need idiotic gestures Kitty's life is on the line Nightcrawler is saying this in public where everyone can hear him ally and enemy alike he is calling his commander stand and challenge for a fight for basically literally mortal combat an idiotic gesture in front of everybody openly challenging her, openly questioning her and doubting her in this way. I swear, as much as I love Crawler, and I do, I wanted to hit him so hard in his head. I understand him having doubts and having concerns, but that is not how you voice it. You don't outright challenge her. You don't outright doubt her like that. She's the field commander. Fortunately, Storm takes this a lot better than I would have. <laughs> And calmly states that, yes, she understands that, but she's insistent that she fights Callisto. Just as Callisto is insistent that she fight her. She then kind of tries to get Callisto's goat, saying that, unless you're afraid of me. And Callisto's like, yeah, no, that'll be the day. I'm not scared of you. So, they, so both Callisto and Storm change into fighting clothes, which... For Callisto is, you know, leather pants, leather jacket, shirt, you know, the typical hard rock, punk, punk rock fashions of the early 80s. Where Storm, for some reason, de decided to just take off every accessory on her costume, with the exception of the headpiece, her cape, which actually does factor into this fight. And for some reason, decided to fight without her boots on. It's never explained why she decided to go barefoot. You're walking around in a New York City bomb shelter that's been abandoned and it's underground. I take the subways. You don't walk around barefoot in, in, in New York City underground anything. God knows what it, what it is you're stepping into. So I don't quite understand Storm's reasoning on that. It's not as if, say, like she's, a, she's an earthbender and she needs to, f to feel the ground beneath her. Okay, it, it, her, her, her powers don't work like that. Anyway, they, so they formally get the fight set up. Callisto explains the rules that Storm cannot use her uh, powers, that even if Storm summon, summons a gust of wind, she'll have Kitty killed. 
Storm accepts the uh, terms, and then, then they start circling each other. The uh, narration states that um, Callisto's a huntress, that she has physical abilities that rival uh, Wolverine, so, so she's built up pretty good. And I actually don't doubt the narration, of, although the fight doesn't last all that long. The, the mistake Callisto makes, and it's even hinted at in the, um, in the narration, is that she's arrogant. The narration, the text box description says that Callisto thinks that she has to fight one, that she's going to take her uh, time, and we even see it. We see that, that they start swiping at each other. Callisto slashes uh, Storm's face. Then Storm uh, misses an attack. Callisto slices at her arm. She even, you know, taunts her, saying, saying that 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 Storm's making the fight too easy. That's when Storm actually uses her uh, cape, wraps it around Callisto's knife hand, and after briefly commenting that Callisto talks too much, Storm doesn't even waste any time. She lifts Callisto's knife hand up in the air with the same arm she's using to hold the cape, takes her other hand, and just stabs Callisto right in the heart. You don't see the actual stab stab wound, but you you just see that shock on Callisto's face. It's actually one of the best panels in a in a book full of what is in my opinion bad art. The actual moment when Callisto is stabbed, in my in my opinion, is one of the best panels because first of all, it doesn't show you anything, but you know what just happened. It's just that look of shock on Callisto's face. So then Storm walks away, Callisto collapses over, <laughs> she dramatically collapses over, over several panels, Storm walks away, she, uh, f she, she frees Warren, she frees Angel, and she tells the Morlocks that, you know, she's the leader now, if they have an issue with it, they can challenge her and end up like Callisto. But then she also explains that they have a home with, the, with uh, Xavier if they want it. Caliban says that he under, he he knows that Storm's words are true, but that the Morlocks be, belong underground. But he hopes that now the the uh, Morlocks and the X Men can be friends. So after that, uh, they're basically prepping to leave, and Kurt, uh, sorry, uh, Storm asks asks Kurt if Callisto is still alive. Cal uh, Kurt. Kurt says that she's just barely alive. It's fortunate that they have a healer that that heals wounds. And unlike in today's comics, the hinting the the um, healer that the healer that can only heal wounds is actually mentioned earlier in the story. Because when uh, Nightcrawler is examining Kitty, he and he asks one of one of the Morlocks if they have a healer. One of the one of the more the Morlock he's speaking to says, "Yeah, 